<laughs> yeah, it is. Um, that voice is a scary voice, but it's the voice I, I teach to um, when I do teach um, during the week. And uh, it comes on, it startles me, but it also gets me kind of in my mode. So welcome, welcome to Salamander's very first, if you can't tell, very first virtual reading. Um, so happy that you're able to make time to be here with it virtually to celebrate this issue. Um, it's, it's such a strange time. And if this is your first vir virtual reading, welcome. Um, it's, there's no substitute, you know, it's not like, oh, this is the exact same, like, no, there's no substitute. This is not a substitute for an actual reading. Um, it's its own thing. And as its own thing, hiccups, but also I hope um, a good sense of community. I love that we're getting different, uh, different like lights from outside from people like over here on the East Coast, it's dark. So I've got my little lamp on. Um, but I know people on the West Coast, you still got sun out. So um, you probably aren't seeing the snow we're seeing over here right now either. Yeah. Snow already. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I wanna go ahead and kind of get started. The way this is gonna go is I'm gonna give a brief introduction. I'm gonna share a little bit of my editor's note from the issue, issue number 50, five zero. Um, and then I will introduce each reader as they um, read, as they're about to read. Um, or ready to read for about 12 to 15 minutes. And um, if you need the text for accessibility purposes, please uh, drop me a note in the chat. I'm happy to give you a file uh, or email you one right off. I'll, I'll hook you up. Um, and then towards the end, we'll just have a brief kind of uh, ending kind of moment that we'll have. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and do my introduction. Part of my introduction is gonna be um, just welcoming y'all to this space as well as um, doing a small tribute for uh, the poet Leslie McGrath. Uh, so I will first start off with reading you some of my, because it, it's such a strange time and the phrase strange time doesn't begin to cover it, right? Um, and putting this issue together, a lot of people, if you're not in the, um, in the production of literary journals, you'll see, you, you don't get to know when things get put together. And so literally the production, production meaning me at my computer working with InDesign with all the contents um, happened in March, right? When things were shutting down, when things were beginning to be the way they are now. And so when it came time to write the editor's note amidst all this, that this is what I had in mind or what was going on in my mind. This is kind of like end of March into, into April. Um, and yeah, actually, we, our, our schedule kind of got pushed back and it was May we were putting this together because I mentioned the protests in here. So, all right. So from the editor's note, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, just a bit of it. The work in this issue is from another time. Submitted before the pandemic and selected as the world transitioned into the new abnormal, the work in this issue reflects experiences and aesthetics literally untouched by the tension and despair that presently pervade our respective lives to varying degrees. Yet despite this distance, or maybe because of it, there is a parallel tension throughout this issue, answering our present circumstances with solidarity one moment and solace via reality checks the next. Case in point, it is no mistake that the issue begins with a poem titled, Everything's Fine and Fucked, followed by a poem titled, On the Brink of Extinction. Together, these two titles make for a fine statement of how bleak things have felt during the late winter spring months. The issue closes with a review that has the following ending words. Whatever else is happening, life goes fast. Don't forget to look. These words stand out at a time when so much is happening that it is hard to look. Between these two sets of statements are two sides of an urgent need to articulate weakness and weakness. Understanding and honoring not just the role of witness, but also the stakes which our respective lives are shaped and guided by is more important now than ever. Along with the cracks exposed through the scrambled response to the pandemic by our country's leadership, the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and too many other black lives continue to make starkly clear the pervasiveness of systemic racism in our society. While we made a public statement at the time, I feel it worth restating here that we at Salamander stand with, the black stand with Black Lives Matter and protesters in their work against police brutality and the systemic oppression that continues to affect 
Black lives and lives that are marginalized. We will continue to work against inequity and racism within the publishing world and look forward to working on initiatives that reflect this statement. And what I'll add, coming back to this intro, um, this editor's note uh, months later, is how much it still resonates. I feel like there was no way to prepare for this. There was no way to like, I don't know about y'all, but there's no metaphor for this. All the, all the language around it is, is kind of worn. And, and I feel like that just pushes us to write when we get to, when we, when we find that space to write, to refresh it. Um, but it also makes um, events like this important because in events, in events like this, we get to form some of the, this community, have this kind of bond. Um, I've done a couple of virtual readings and different kinds of events. And I'm always surprised at um, what it means for people to make time for this and to make space. So thank you all for being uh, a part of this community, whatever you've survived to get to this point, to this moment. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, so in keeping with this idea of community, I also wanna take a moment to um, say a couple words and read a poem by Leslie McGrath, a poet who recently died uh, this past summer. Um, she is a former contributor to Salamander and just an important figure in our history. And I just wanna share, I mean, I feel like the, the biggest compliment you can give another writer is to read their work, to spend time with them. I mean, that's the thing, right? That's the, the hours and hours and hours will never be truly assessed that a writer puts into writing, but spending time with the work, the finished product, and, and let them know, hey, I read it, it's cool. Um, I see you, it's big. So I wanna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen because that's what we do these days, um, is share screens. And I wanna share a poem by uh, Leslie McGrath. And I now see the poem, here you go. So this is Ars Poetica and I see there's a recording so I'm gonna have her, I'm gonna ha have Leslie be here with us. All right, somebody just told me the audio isn't coming through. Oof, was there no, so you just saw me like look very serious in the corner and then kind of like this. Like I said, it's our first virtual reading. I'm gonna go ahead and read it. Um, actually, no, she's got a good speaking voice. So let me actually pop out of here. Okay, and reshare my screen. So this is Ars Poetica by Leslie McGrath. To have even a lotto chance of getting somewhere within yourself. You don't quite know, but feel. To cling to the periphery through the constant gyroscopic redrawing of its provinces. To make what makers make, you must set aside certainty. Leave it a lumpy backpack by the ticket window at the station. Let the gentleman in pleated khakis pressed for time claim it the certainty, not the poem. And yeah, that's that's one of her poems. I love it for the, not just the play at the end of like pleated khakis, press for time. I'm like, I see what you're doing, Leslie. That's clever. But that, that the ambiguity of that final um, couplet of like, what's at stake here? Like the certainty, not the poem. Like so even without certainty, we have poetry. And I think that's a, a thing we need to hear now before the election during this pandemic, during all of the things that are happening right now, even though we may not have certainty, we have poetry, we have literature, we have the human experiences that we can convey um, between each other. So thank you again for being here. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and get the start introducing our readers. Uh, first up will be Joe Kane. 
then and Tilfoil, and then Rajiv Mohabir. And I'll read the contributor bio, and then I'm going to just say a couple words about their work. So Joan Nebiyuk Kane is Inupiaq with family from King Island in Mary's Igloo, Alaska. She is the author of seven collections of poetry and prose, most recently, Another Bright Departure. She is the Hills Bush Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University and currently raises her son as a single mother in Cambridge. And what stood out to me about Joan's work, I'm so glad to be able to, to feature it in this issue, is the sharpness of the language in it and how it, it evokes insight from just nuances and direct kind of like palpable pressure. So anyway, I will now hand it off to Joan. Uh, thank you. Um, it's good to see everybody tonight. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's not me. Um, I don't know. This is, <laughs> um, all right. Um, I'm going to read some poems. I'm just going to read them straight through. Um, rookeries. All men knew a secret of the northern part of an old world, a less perfect idea. For the bicornuate woman, it was an island. Though its birds lose our trust, we might learn their language. After all, we have been taught to read and write, to remove our hands from other work as we watch water twist into rock, to cover our wounds, staying alive light after light. For something, I worry. The moon pronounced with clarity its known topography, our letters and lists, reconstructed grammars. They replaced the ways in which we were grabbed and pushed then shoved. Set a fine wife and her children to row with indefinite orders. Lineal migration on a small scale is not nautical, but conflictual. Of those men, we knew I could never do them any good. In this way, I forget and let the wind river. It gales and tears at my shoulders and wrists. Dark traffic. And the snows buffer the sound of a voice set forth. I thought her lost already, that she had gone to neglect the late migration. Before it ceases, ice collapses easily. There is no day without a symptom. Consolation may turn out to be a guttural practice after all, the small gesture of sound lodged deep before it glides without warning downward. There is nothing but the wind a howl and dive where water is thrown over water and sewn into it, a howl and dive of wind, water she found flown over water where once we found ice, where the snow once stuttered the sound of that shouter shouting for this listener, holding her head in her hands, the head in its fine blank way, an original. Nalakia, he, beat her blood into the crowberry stained ground, her cervic, bru cervix bruised by his various parts, auguring daughter into mother wordlessly, mouth agape for years on end. And now he wends his way atop new summits until she knocks him into hell. She cannot say she will not see the migrating snow geese bright in the blue sky again, flock call struck into her skull while the ravines thaw when they should really be fixed in ice. He delegates women to rip follicles from her scalp and she remembers a story of a season when the ice gave no sustenance. You remember with her, even as you forget her wounds. Various instructions for translating her past. To make the lost person's location become known, forget nothing of the field and see that you were wrong, as in no field, no exilic, no arcticality, no longer a knot of inexplicable pain, as in it makes no light and misunderstandings are to be listed and left unresolved as the snow disappears, unless she tramples at the brink of a public abyss, see Sura and Surat and the boy who was surprised when he rolled to a stop in Tsikhnazurak. He thought the land a long way off. When we had access to the same facts, when we had access to the same language, before he made a wound of political declension and before she knew what it was to have evacuated our island, 
her story and series of syllables so badly that we might yet step backward and conjure again up to the mountain or out on the sea. We no longer have to refuse the help of people, such people who want us dead. Seish. The Rift Lake too refuses coherence of any sort. It's ice encircled by trees, dark though slowless, whose unleafed limbs yaw untroubled by snow in its own right, dense and historical. And so let us forget all metronymic rhythm, improbable as it is unbeautiful. A cold moon, a toxin peeling, the page become an outline for the lake entire, which as we see is not whole. On an overflowed shore, the fractures give rise unto other fractures, minor but of little matter. In months to come, the children will draw distinctions between shock and aftershock. Note the beads of sap globed gold from the fissured truss that would be what? Body of woman swindled down to water. I split ourselves into the brimming night. Field work. Another day of heat. Strangers continue to wobble across the horizon, bringing drought when instead we should have deluge. I steep snow lichen in water I drew from a lake which has since gone dry. At sea, few understood me, as though I induced a sickness that deafened, then healed. As before, I predict lies to be pushed from the boat time and time again. Nevertheless, I expect to get by while their widowers seek refuge with their provident families. Perhaps a storm will pile fish at their doors when the red tide rises. Perhaps they will not follow as we move moon into moon under another sky. Um. I defer a second opinion. The light, unevenly gray, well beyond the triple pane, may be neglected or itself self-filtering, obscuring as it crystals into existence, as it opaques the whore on the fence and bracked to branch of all my trees, our yard, my debt, unpruned lilac, two liability spruce to the north, the ostentatious sprawl of crabapple once fertile next door, then storm felled, now thrust into the yarrow as it overgrows our bed. A triplet of rowan, then sour, then choke cherry, not least two or five cedar, cottonwood and aspen, and an alder hell I squalled predictably into the right of way. A birch I see almost too much to name. Black spruce, too. You don't have a personality disorder, said she, a good doctor, but one of three women of color licensed to practice psychiatry in the state of Alaska between Gaffaws, another in Fairbanks. In what use is she to me so far away, probably overbooked, and kind enough to do what she would, to see me as a patient to prescribe whatever I will take for whatever she happens to think she might fix or for now temporarily stay. I see the dark horizon in the West. It rhymes with nothing, nothing you see. Um, I'm just gonna read two more poems. Um, this is a really new one. I will probably never read again. Um, the way, yeah, the way I feel about it. Um, on never looking upward in battle. Some years have passed since I could get out on the land to take in its emanation of Ayu and Impetrum Nigurum and Selene Aqualis and to entwine at the root and take the balm of each mound in hand. For in a final summer, one gets no respite from everything on fire elsewhere. And in a final line, I find I can no longer grind a number of troubles into the tactical jangle of emergency and poise, and thus can no longer talk to white people in the way they demand. 
which is to say I can try the countless new configurations in order to be ignored, to be called squaw, to be left for dead. Broke and feverish with my children shining and vital, I throw every window open to bring in the odor of the ungroved tree and invoke its decedence throughout the avenues and colonial tangle and call gale and rain into the river near, for we are not lost in such rapid changes, for the ways in which our contusions pound, pulse us to outlive those who would harrow, and for ever may the stars have their stations, and may the world survive such snow and such ash. Um, and this is the last poem, um, which I was grateful to have included in this issue of Salamander, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone else's poems tonight. Uh, war poem. If you will get through this hard time, there will be others to harrow harder, Asper. The rude heart must continue to blurt and bluster and batter. We've never known the latterly sweetness he's been after. I saw, I say, an ally in guise, though I grasp the forest as it sires its own dark. I, gyred in decisure, by a lilted pulse abreast an alpine rill whose brink begets snow to fresh it from berry born land, kip ming niak to, to twist with row. Kia, kia, bye, boys, amen, systems quit us, see us go. All right. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate that. I'm dropping the link to Joan's chat book sublingual in the chat there. John, thank you so much for reading for us. I really appreciate that. I I should switch the screen is what I'm hearing from my 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 conscience is what I'll call it. <laughs> Replace father. Hey, there I am. All right. Thank you, John, for reading for us. That was awesome. Um I I love the though the way you present your work and it's um, it's sharpness, but it's, it's, the, the, but the, it's a sharpness that opens things up. I love how um, the poem that you will never read again, um, as well as the, the last poem, how, you, how both like are examples of presence, whether it's the interrogation of intersections or um, presenting the words from two different languages in the same space and how they, they kind of stand up. Lovely, lovely to hear that. Uh, please check out our uh, her other work. Very cool stuff. Um, all right, so we're going to move forward with Anne Kilfoyle. And the thing, um, I'll, I'll read her bio, but first I'll say that um, when I read Anne's um, short story, I was just like, again, I talk in my intro, in my editor's note about um, that this issue, the work from this issue comes from a different time, right? It comes from a different, it was pre-pandemic. Um, but this uh, Anne's short story stood out to me as like pretty, pretty speak, what is it? Uh, pretty fitting for the time. And, and you'll soon see why she's gonna share it with us. Um, so let me make sure I'm on the right page. All right, so Anne Kilfoyle grew up in Boise, Idaho, an emerging writer. Her work has appeared in Epoch and was recognized in the top 25 for the Glimmer Train Short Story Award for New Writers. She holds an MFA from Eastern Washington University and lives in Oregon and lives in Tigard. And we were geeking out a little bit earlier that there's a really good barbecue joint near where she, in the city that she lives in. Um, so with, with that random non sequitur, uh, please welcome Anne Kilfoyle. Hi, uh, thanks for Jose for having me and Joan for the great reading. Um, there's some outside noise going on, uh, and my backup solution encountered technical difficulties. So, uh, if it becomes too much of an interference, someone interrupt me, um, and we'll, we'll figure something else out. Um, yeah, so I, before I start my reading, um, I do want to acknowledge that here in Tigard, Oregon, I'm on the ancestral homelands of the Kalapuya people who have lived here since time immemorial. Um, I hope that this is a reminder for myself, if no one else, that colonization is ongoing. Um, and I will 
read the piece from the issue called Double Yoked. Double Yoked. The emergency evacuation alert is followed by a serene 20 seconds in which I decide to remove the eggs from their ice bath. It's the simplest action available to me and I know I can do it well. Of everything that comes after, all the urgent decisions and physical struggles, I'm less sure. On the kitchen slab, my phone is freaking out. I plunge my hand into cold water, holding the eggs against the bottom of the glass bowl as I pour. It's a Saturday in late winter. This close to the northern border, our world is bright and thin-edged, perfectly beautiful. Go outside and the light will soup you. My husband, Jesse, comes into the kitchen to have a coughing fit. He looks at what I'm doing, his face particled and gray. The water, he says, maybe we shouldn't be wasting it. The blast of fear has already hit him. It occurs to me that he won't last long, and it's a dreamy thought, soft as trailing threads. Standing at the sink, one hand shocked numb, I'm so surprised by tenderness for him that I want to cluck. Jesse and I are as prepared for this as we can be, given that we're both off social media. The government announced the initial threat three days ago, but we didn't know about it until Jesse's coworker, Nate, started dry heaving in their collaboration space. The Safeway shelves were empty within an hour afterward, meaning we got stuck with the bummers of off-brand coconut water and marshmallow hazelnut spread. Even though the president said the hostility is certain, I'm a believe it when I see it kind of gal, so I thought it wouldn't come to anything. I thought it was an overreaction. Between you, me, and the fence post, I'm still not entirely convinced otherwise, despite the emergency alerts. Anyone can say anything these days. You want in on something else? The last three days have been good days, some of the best. We have been holding our breath, but also our problems got smaller. We blew off payments, forgot about the bare spackling, the compulsive drinking, the silverfish slipping through the bathroom, and the way I sometimes feel when I walk into a room containing Jesse. None of it mattered. Our relief was felt down to the wooden bones of the house. Our biggest fear wasn't mass annihilation. It was that we'd have to go back to how things were, back to our jobs and our lives. We'd have to do the laundry and put up flyers for the house cat we'd, we'd quickly lost track of. I'm worried this doesn't sound right. How can I put it? I mean, I felt something different. With Jesse and I, we're fine. We've spent a decade whittling our lives into simplicity. Every year, another complication is cut away. This is the opposite of most couples, I gather, but it's how we have made it work. As a duo, we are slick. We'll slip through your hands because we have nothing to catch on. Imminent doom is a complication, no argument, but seen another way, it's extraordinarily simple. That's what I mean. Jesse is right that I shouldn't be running the water. With nothing else to do while we waited for death, we watched YouTube. Every survival video insisted that after a widespread event of any kind, water would be the most precious resource. One video showed a dead cow floating around in a pond, then panned over to a sunburned white guy drinking from the other end. Jesse minimized the tab to order a $350 water filter on Amazon Prime, one that removes viruses with a hand crank, but so far it hasn't arrived. In our kitchen, he's scrolling the confirmation email again, seeing if the delivery status has been updated. I defend my water waste by saying eggs are a superfood. He nods. His neck where it tucks below his jaw has the wiring of an outdoorsman, although we're mostly living room people. He has a history of making things look easy. I guess I'll get the bags, he says, and slowly shuffles down the hall to the mudroom where our roller bags are filled with socks and Nutella. Jesse is many things that I am not, a person who clears the lint screen and opens the door for the cat. Jesse knows exactly when to walk out on an argument and he can still surprise me. 
Yesterday, I squirmed my fingers into his armpits to cheer him up, and he laughed once, almost a cough, and said, Kira, I'm not ticklish. Another alert comes in. We are supposed to have evacuated from population centers by now. I don't know if our city qualifies, but the neighbors seem to think so. From the kitchen window, I see traffic backing up on our street, a parade of compact SUVs with pale men at the wheel looking overboiled and risky. The Fosters are idling around the end of our driveway. Their grade school kiddo, Bryson, has rolled down the rear window and stuck his arm out, wielding a small wooden bat. He brandishes the bat, which is more like a club, thick and short, takes zero aim, and whams it down on the outside of the car door. His parents, Lydia and Darren, both sweethearts, jump in their seats. I scoff. I don't ever want a Bryson, but I gotta admit he's a good character. He'd be a loss. Jamie has returned with our bags, one in either hand. I love it when his wrists are tense like they are, but his face right now isn't my favorite. He doesn't even look familiar. Are you laughing? He sounds like he has the flu, meaning there's some emotion he's trying to downplay. Oh no, I say, it's just Bryson being a little shit. I motion out the window and see that Bryson has dropped his bat onto the street. He's crying now, which is somehow not what I expected. Uh, it's further disconcerting to look from his face back to Jesse's, where the same locked in fear makes me feel shrink wrapped. Maybe you're right that we should hustle, I say, trying to regain good footing. I nestle the wet eggs in a paper towel. Jesse's shoulders are moving a little. Actually, he's swaying side to side. What do you mean? He says, why? What happened? I see that I've upset him further. Nothing, I say. Well, I mean, nothing apart from the global attack. Jesse is from the next state where the dried up hills are brushy with grass if they're not crumbling away. The prize of his hometown is its rodeo. And even though Jesse grew up riding horses, he will forever feel inferior to men who wear cowboy hats professionally. He claims this to be true despite my feelings about men in cowboy hats, and I have to respect him for saying so. His parents still live there, and that's our goal, to make the 200-mile journey to Jesse's childhood home on Lulark Road, where his mom is waiting with a glass of iced Chardonnay and his dad is napping with work boots on. We're going there because it's not a population center, and it's the last place we really felt good. My parents live at a distance that is inconvenient for travel. His parents both smile in a way that makes their eyes disappear. I heard that couples who look similar have a stronger bond because it means they mirror each other's expressions, which is something you do with people you like. I've been looking hard at Jesse and me, our reflections as we brush our teeth over the splashed sink every night, waiting for the similarities to emerge, but I guess we're young yet. In the kitchen, Jesse's panic is escalating. Kira, will you please talk to me? We need to do something. We need to act. His fear has tripped us into a new script, and now Jesse is a soft scroll in my hand and knitting. The last time he looked at me like this was in the very beginning, when we put ourselves at stake. I think, if we survive, I will transform into someone better. Change is always scary, they say, and they say that fear is excitement without the breath. <laughs> That's how I feel, breathless as the start of a movie. What we need to do is say goodbye to our lives here, but I try to relax my jaw. I say, fine, put on your heavy socks and find your shoes. Let's blow this joint. He huffs, but I know he's grateful because he holds my eye for the first time in a while. A small moment in, when, in which it's just the two of us, nobody honking on the street, no shrieks from Bryson, no whistling air high above our heads, just us, like we're proud of the work we've done here. Of course it has occurred to me that where we're going on Lulark Road has no trees, little water. We could have made better plans. We will need food, more than eggs, and water tablets, better shoes than my slip-ons and probably even weapons. 
we will need a thousand items that we've not yet ordered on Amazon, but this send off, the way that we are saying goodbye to our little home doesn't bother me. What I feel is better than relief even because it's an opportunity. This is an opportunity to get it right and I'm watching us and I know we're getting it right. The eggs in their half soggy paper towel have stopped steaming. I set their nest on the countertop and one rolls free. The egg rolls with a swift hollow horn slide across the counter toward the drop. Jesse flinches. I jump as if sparked and hold out my hand for when it goes off the edge. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, that was awesome. Let me see, okay. Hey, all right. Um, no, thank you, Anne, that was lovely. I appreciate you sharing that story with us and the chance to see it. Yeah, let's do. You, you can't imagine, like, as a teacher, I think I get a, like, a license to kind of geek out about little, like, emoji things like that. So I always make sure to, like, <laughs> and with an update, we get to do little hearts, too, so. Uh, but no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I agree. Katie, our managing editor, Katie Sticka, is in the is in the audience. She says, so amazing to hear the story out loud, Anne. Agreed. No worries about the home. That comes happen. Um, if you want to find out more about Anne's work, I've just dropped a link to her website in the chat there. Do check it out. Um, thank you all for hanging in there. Um, I'm thinking, too. Because, um, yeah, coming back, celebrating this issue, it's the 50th issue of Salamander, like in my head, like if you were to talk to me February, right, shortly after our, our um, I think it was February 21st or 22nd that we did a, a reading for our um, issue 49. And if you talk to me like towards the end of February, I would have been like, yeah, the summer issue, like it's going to come out, we're going to do something big, we're going to be in downtown Boston. Uh, that did not happen. But um, so it means a lot that y'all are here. It means a lot that we got this issue out. I feel like everything is uh, kind of counted towards survival, right? It's something I, I remind my students, I tell my students, and I tell I, at my readings too, I, I make sure to tell people like, hey, be kind to yourselves uh, because everyone is going through their own compartmentalization at this moment um, as we go through our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but also coming back to this issue, I remember working on it, um, and actually my first Zoom event. So I want to congratulate y'all because I'm clicking through. And um, for those of you at all, every camera's on, camera's on, thank you. Um, but I remember my first Zoom event, um, a poetry event specifically, this is totally a poet event. Uh, one guy was so drunk that he like fell asleep on camera. Like it, it was, it was kind of, and yeah, it was a group of poets, Boston poets. And I'm just like, okay, this is my, <laughs> this is the crowd, all right. Um, and so I'm watching y'all and I'm like, no one's asleep yet. So we're, we're winning. We've, we've learned during the pandemic <laughs> to not fall asleep on camera. Um, anyway, and, and points to my students because no student, as far as I could tell, has fallen asleep on camera. So anyway, um, just kind of doing that there. That image of the egg falling is just perfect. I agree, Anna. I agree. Um, so thank you, Anne, for reading that. All right, I'm going to introduce um, Rajiv Mohabir. Uh, Rajiv um, is, funny thing, like he and I, we reached out to each other um, because we were moving to Boston at the same time. Um, and there's a cup of coffee that we're, we're going to have, I promised. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the city keeps us busy. Um, and then the pandemic happened. Um, but um, but yeah, I'm excited to, to have you all hear his work. I was excited to have it in this issue. Um, and that, that's just want to say that real quick is that I haven't forgotten. Um, uh, Boston isn't the first big city I've lived in. I, I did um, my MFA at uh, NYU and um, living, I didn't live in the city. I lived in Jersey City. I'm going to be honest, I'm going to own it. Like I, I can't brag like, oh, I lived in New York City. I'm like, no, I didn't. I lived in Jersey, um, straight up. But um, one of the things that I, I met up with a friend um, in New York early on, and one of the things they said was like, oh yeah, you're gonna hear this phrase in this, in, because you're in a big city, you're gonna hear this phrase and just know that people don't mean it. You're gonna hear people say, hey, let's do lunch or hey, let's get together. And they, they don't mean it. You're never gonna get together with them. Um, so that I, I've been self-conscious 
ever ever since then that if I'm ever in a big city again, I got to be like, no, we're going to have lunch. We're going to have that coffee. So anyway, um, Rajiv uh, Mahabir is the author of two poetry collections and a translator. His memoir, Antiman, won the 2019 New Immigrant Writing Prize from Reckless Books and is forthcoming in 2021. Currently, he is, he is an assistant professor of poetry in the MFA pro program at Emerson College and translations editor at Wax Wing Magazine. Raja, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and thank you for inviting me into this issue. Um, you know, my respect and uh, thanks go out to, um, you know, Jose, you, Anna, the editors, Katie, um, as well as um, the people who have read before, Joan, what an honor it is to read with you. I have long loved your work um, and it's just fantastic to share space with you. And Anne um, as well, so lovely to get to hear your work spoken aloud. Um, and I am going to start my reading with uh, two poems that are in the issue of Salamander. Um, and so the first one is called Belief. You see only an impression in dug earth long settled into dent on the forested floor, an unmarked grave where a corpse sinks, moss covered granite field stones in electric green. The surface falls as a body returns into dirt's electrons and nucleus. What binds substance and rests? To pine means to desire, to walk across a graveyard, across the street, to connect with your future's dust, underfoot bone, inside bone, cells that make blood, and deeper, atoms in the shape of orbits and suns, every smallest bit of you expanding. And at first these poems might not seem connected, but actually the space that I wrote them um, are, 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 uh, is the connective tissue here. Um, I wrote this um, poem as I lived in Obelega, um, Alabama. Um, and um, across the street from where I was living, ironically on a place called India Road, um, uh, where I think I'm the only person of Indian origin who probably ever lived on that road, um, was uh, a Jim Crow era um, African-American uh, burial ground um, that had turned into a dump um, that the local white community had um, you know, used as their, their garbage dump. And so I would take daily walks through this, um, this uh, graveyard that was then cleaned up by an Eagle Scout from the, um, I think, Episcopalian church just down the street. Um, and I would, I was, uh, you know, fortunate enough to walk um, through the, the graveyard with some um, uh, historians who studied uh, graveyards and unmarked graveyards in the area. And so that's part of what comes into this next poem called Ancestry.com. And I don't know how many of you are um, fans of this, but quite honestly, they're, um, they're, advertisement tactics are racist and so rooted in the settler colonial project, um, you know, and also in the uh, continued um, erasure and um, of African American problems um, in the United States today that folks are told to come to ancestry.com and find out how brown or black you or native you are um, as a way to kind of, uh, you know, participate uh, in this uh, state uh, in a way that continues to disenfranchise people. Um, you know, this is what we call um, the logic of elimination. Um, Patrick Wolf, who uh, wrote about this. But anyway, so ancestry.com. Um, I come from, I should say, I come from a community of um, people who survived indentured labor uh, after the British outlawed the, the transatlantic slave trade in 1834. They turned their greedy eye to uh, the, the crown of their jewel, which was India. Um, and I come from people who survived indentured contracts in South America. Ancestry.com. Please nobody sue me. 
What happens when no one who could hold a pen saw your great aunt as human? Records and recordings pinprick your necks back. Before they called us stupid coolies, we descended from the moon, made of the star, made of the star white, so magical, it's actually dark skin. Can you trace jandi flags on bamboo poles amongst the South's Christ is alive lawn signs as if he's a mayoral hopeful? And now you can prove for white eyes that your hands are human hands and not animal. Churchill's pile of brown bodies rotting, a stench no British Christian could smell. We won't be there in those files, unable as we were to write. Can you think of anything whiter than silence and erasure? A paper rubbed into holes, rubber dust and flecks gathering on the margins like carrion crows. And now, three generations and sees away, your fiance sifts the archives to name the slaves his family bequeathed as chattel, whose remains were like those hawked by Confederates at Angels Antiques in Obelega, Alabama, and urges you, here, take this cup, spit until you reach this line. Staying in this like beautiful world of Obelika, I'll read the next poem called Drawn. At dusk, small brown bats fall from the eaves of the porch, having made a home for brown fur. A cloud of mosquitoes rises from the lake. With erratic wing strokes, bats sense their prey. I can only see or understand by what it is not. A small voice as a guide. All those years I have resisted a home in the South. I don't know what sense can be divined from the pinholes in black, or if they drive me into the night darkly hungry for a safety I can't see, but longing for some warm thing to fill me, a perch for an evening, a cup of jasmine tea, the end of feeling as though this life is a mockery of a life. I've been afraid, I'm not ashamed to say, of the weight of a brown queer body against a Confederate flag. I walk barefoot into a backdrop of stars, something else I feared for rattlers and coral snakes under leaves, a diabetic foot puncture by a branch or glass. But now I want to feel the ground. I don't know what draws me to wonder. And I've come to these red clay hills with an open chest so that I can finally lay bare what of myself I have forgotten, I've hidden, living in boxes for years, running, not allowing myself a shelf, even to place a coaster, before all of my bats exodus at once into frenzy, which is actually an orchestrated dance that draws them to what they want, to what sustains them. <clears throat> More recently, I've been kind of turning my uh, myself uh, into this project of examining, um, you know, parts of myself that I've left behind and parts of myself that I've ignored or, <clears throat> excuse me, that resist easy kind of uh, labels or finding findings. And so if I belong to a spiritual tradition, I mean, it would probably be uh, related to the mystical poetry of the devotional poets like Kabir and Mirab Mirabai, who believed in the kind of spirituality where the divine is um, without body and pervading all bodies. Um, and so these next, this next poem is called Ghar Ghar Deepak Barai, 
And um, it's a title of a, a poem by Kabir translated into English by uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And these are old poems um, that he translated. And I've taken the titles of these poems and I'm kind of using them as uh, jumping off points into writing poems. And so uh, this is Ghar Ghar Deepak Kabarai. I'll burn in my home for another 30 years, maybe fewer. The spun cotton of my body bent before metformin, gemfibrazil, lisinopril. Today may as well be Diwali. I've hand rolled ladoos of gram and ghee on each one. Heartline, lifeline, mound of Venus. I've lined up clay vessel after clay body, each red life thrown into the river after sputtering into black. My head is on fire. I'm still hoping for a jasmine to open as though a door to my skull before it explodes on the pyre. I want to see, I want to see myself as dust, still pressed together with blood, the palm print of being formed by hands, the sun shaft through the windows. Um, let's see, uh, the last poem that I have for you um, is called uh, Tatvam Asi and uh, you know, uh, you are tatvam asi, you are that. Um, and I titled the poem uh, as such to wrestle back the concept from um, American modernists um, and to show a kind of different stake in this kind of spirituality that's in practice today. The God of fire descends to light the forest, to fill you with flame. Everyone you meet, you scorch. Inside, you, an oak blazes unconsumed. I told you before the bird inside you loosens her grip on the bow and flies to the lake. She wings now to carry water, one beakful at a time, to douse the flame. She will not let the forest whose berries plumped her breast burn away. Such devotion chills me to shame. Breathe. Some sparrow inside your forest wants you to remember yourself. Hollow beaks are corridors of song. On the stone path, leaves smash their heads to bits. Come to this garden. You will not need yourself. The temple bell keeps the hour of the falling branches. Here, not even your shadow holds your feet, the tongues of your footfall. All leaves will fall and scrape bodies to dust. Everything, stone, sinks, twigs, rock scrapings, leaves, the book of Isaiah cries out. You cry out. Listen, taste the scabs. Iron. Your fingernails part from their beds, open as mouths, and strum out summer's dirge. Listen to the notes of night's mouth. The bedclothes are its lips, and your body its tongue. Don't wait for your love to put his lips to your double read and play. I have already said. Your body is a shehenai, and outside monsoon cycles, droplets draw back into the sky and rain. I tell you, you are also water. A doe wets her tongue with dew. Soon she disappears into the forest line. Come. Spring throbs beyond your closed door. Come. Pour wine. You've drawn curtains to black out the windows. What can I say? 
Saturn and Mercury, crows and saints alike orbit the sun inside you. Your skin and bone are a flute. Each lead to a each lead to a note of music. Before the rain comes, come outside and play. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, so claps, spotlights. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, really, Roger, thank you so much. That was awesome. If you want to find out more about his work, I have just dropped his site in the chat as well. Um, so good to see everyone um, as we kind of wrap up. Uh, just one more round of applause and um, thanks for everybody who participated tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to try to get this, uh, we're recording this, we're going to get this up on our site in one form or another. Um, and yeah, hopefully this won't be our last virtual reading. I'm trying to own it, right? Like this is a uh, out of um, out of necessity to the moment, but like moving forward, like hey, this could be a way to kind of do our thing. So um, again, thank you all for the community for being here. I really appreciate it, and um, and do check out these writers. Also, Salamander is open for submissions, so please um, hit us up. I want to see what you're reading. Um, we're we're excited to read your work, your poetry, stories, and uh, nonfiction. Um, some of that, um, y'all are. Well, I'm so used to the classroom. I'm ready to be, and you're free to go. I'm like, of course you are. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the.